All right, guys, let's try doing this online. So let's start from the beginning of chapter 18 and just sort of work through it. Let's see, um, I know we did some naming, uh, but the point of today's lecture or this lecture video is to, to cover this chapter um, and to uh, go over the, the characteristic properties and reactions of the amines and amides, and then to just give you some examples of those in real life. Um, okay, so as you can see here, um, am amides and amines, this is an amide here, and you can actually tell that because of the C double O, or the, uh, actually, I think these are just amines here, see if you can tell, so C double O, double, double bond O with an N on it, this functional group right here, there's no O, so these are derivatives of amides, but that N attached to a C double bonded to something else uh, are pretty characteristic. So amines, derivatives, derivatives of ammonia, NH3, uh, and where the H's are being replaced by alkyl groups, and of course the N's have lone pair electrons. Now as far as naming goes, there's the IUPAC uh, system that we went over in class. And then there's common names. Um, with IUPAC, you look at the longest parent name. Uh, and if there are substituents on the N, none of these have an example of that. Um, then you, we would just say N and show the substituent. So here you can see um, various examples. Um, here, this one is 1-propanamine as opposed to 2-propanamine. Uh, butanamine as well, 2-butanamine uh, as opposed to 1-butanamine. This one also having a substituent, 3-methyl-1-butanamine. Um, here we have some substituted N groups. So you can see, uh, in this case, it's an N-methyl on the ethyl, so ethylamine or ethanamine um, here as well. NN-2-methyl, so NN-dimethyl. And then here, uh, longest chain is going to be this pentanamine. It's not on the end, it's on the number two carbon, so it's two pentanamine. And then the groups on it are a methyl group and an ethyl group. So N-ethyl, N-methyl, pentanamine. So if we were naming this one, go ahead and give this one a shot for yourselves. It's worked out over the next couple slides, but we can see that it's a one, two, three, four carbon. So this is gonna be some, tor some sort of butane or butanamine. Looks like it's a 1-butanamine. And then it's got an N-methyl. Oops, guess we don't need we don't need all those lines. N-methyl, 1-butanamine. And again, you guys have access to the slides, so you can look at these worked out, uh, that worked out example on your own. Okay, common names. Common names are pretty easy. You look at the amine, you look at what's on it. So in this case, there's an ethyl group. So we say ethylamine. You look at the nitrogen and you say, what's on it? We've got two methyls. So this is dimethyl amine. This one has three groups, two methyls and an ethyl. So in alphabetical order, we'll say ethyl and then dimethyl amine. I like the common names, they're pretty easy. Um, aromatic amines. So these are amines that are attached to benzenes. So here we have benzene with an NH2 on it. It gets the special name alanine. So then these would be derivatives of alanine. This here is alanine. And so then automatically the nitrogen's on the number one. So we'll say two, three, four bromo aniline. In this case, here would be our aniline if this was an H, but it's not an H. So we'll come in here, make that a methyl, and this is N-methyl aniline. So again, just some, some derivatives. I'm not sure uh, what these names down here are for. They don't seem to match anything. Uh, we could draw 3-chloroaniline. Aniline, two, three, chloro. 
you can classify amines as being primary, secondary, or tertiary. What you're really looking at is how many carbons or groups are attached when there's one carbon group, or when there's two H's, it's primary. When there's two carbon groups, or one H, it's secondary. And when you have three carbon groups and no H's, it is tertiary. Okay, so let's see. Give the common name and classification for these. So I would pause the video, give these a shot for yourself. This is primary because it's only attached to one carbon group. This is tertiary because it's attached to three carbon groups. Oops, all of this. Propylamine, ethyl dimethyl. We already saw an example of that one. Common name of these guys. So again, pause the video, give it a shot. Got an ethyl, an ethyl, and a methyl. So this is diethyl methylamine. Here we've got a benzene group and an ethyl. So this is phenyl, remember? This is ethyl. So ethyl phenyl amine. Oh, or we could use the common name aniline as well. Uh, since aniline is a is a common name. So this would be ethyl phenyl. I mean, or since this is aniline, if this guy was an H, we can say N ethyl aniline. Um, let's see here. Line angle formulas. This is just how they're drawn typically. It's easy to see the classification here because you can see the H's explicitly. Um, let's see here. Properties of amines. So let's talk about whether or not they are soluble in water and have um, high or low melting points relative to other groups that we've looked at. Primary and secondary amines can form hydrogen bonds with water molecules. Tertiary amines can form hydrogen bonds with water, water molecules as well because they have that lone pair of electrons. As far as forming hydrogen bonds with each other, tertiary amines can't do that because they don't have H's. Only the primary and secondary amines can form hydrogen bonds with each other. So that's going to mean they're going to have higher melting points and boiling points than the tertiary amines. Now, as far as forming hydrogen bonds with water, they can do that just 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 as well. Tertiaries, I mean, just as well as primary and secondary, with primary and secondary having an additional hydrogen bond that they can make. Um, we can show that. So here's a here's a primary amine. And uh, let's do another primary amine. So this, this nitrogen's lone pair can hydrogen bond with this hydrogen, and this nitrogen lone pair can hydrogen bond with this hydrogen. So they get two hydrogen bonds uh, to each other. And of course, another molecule can hydrogen bond to the other H. So we get some pretty strong forces. With the tertiary amines, no hydrogen bonding uh, with each other. We would expect then to see that uh, the boiling point with primary amines and secondary amines would be higher than tertiary amines. Primary amines have two hydrogens that they can hydrogen bond to each other with. Of course, between two molecules, they can only ever do two hydrogen bonds. But in a collection of these molecules, they can make several hydrogen bonds with each other. Secondary amines have one less H, so they don't make as many hydrogen bonds. Slightly lower boiling point. And then no hydrogen bonding, lowest boiling point. With water, again, they can all hydrogen bond with water. You can see here the nitrogen, the lone pair of the nitrogen can hydrogen bond with a hydrogen from a water molecule, and the oxygens of waters can hydrogen bond with the hydrogens on the amine. We get three with the primaries, two with the secondaries, and just one hydrogen bond with the tertiaries. So most soluble are the primaries. Least soluble are the tertiaries. Um, as always, six or more carbons tends to decrease our solubility. Longer carbon chains tend to do that. All right, which of the following would be soluble in water? Pause the video, give it a shot. Soluble in water because it has less than six carbons. Soluble in water because
because it has less than six carbons. No functional group that has any kind of hydrogen bonding capabilities, so not soluble. And then more than six carbons uh, in this chain as well as all together. Um, so not soluble in water. We'll see though if we can react this and cause it to become charged, uh, then it will become more soluble. And some of that is right now. Uh, so the amines react as bases. Amines are basic. This is the, the typical reactions. So here is ammonia acting as a base, and then our amines that are ammonia derivatives. Ammonia with water will take a hydrogen off of the water. So NH3 becomes NH4, ammonium. That's charged. The leftovers of the water is hydroxide. So this is why they're bases. Amines will always make hydroxide in water by pulling a hydrogen off of the water. So our methylamine becomes methylammonium, gets an extra hydrogen. Dimethylamine, dimethylammonium, extra hydrogen. Because they're bases, we can neutralize them with acids. When we neutralize them, they form their amine salt. So there's going to be some ions, a positive charge and then a counter ion, a negative charge. Um, and, and you saw in lab, or hope that you saw in lab, that the fish smell that we see in some amines, triethylamine in particular, uh, actually goes away when we make the salt of this. So making this into the ammonium salt, pairing it with some other counter ion, this is a salt. These things don't smell like amines do. Um, so let's take a look at that uh, uh, neutralization reaction. It's very similar to the water reaction. In fact, water is a weak acid, right? So water does the same exact thing, gives a hydrogen. So HCl, though, gives a hydrogen and doesn't leave a strong base left over. Um, so what we're going to see here, uh, let me go ahead and get rid of that. All right, so methylamine reacting with HCl becomes the charged species. The name changes from methylamine to methylammonium. Typical when you're naming salts, you name the whole salt, so you say the counter ion chloride. <laughs> dimethylamine becomes dimethylammonium. And again, depending on what this is, it's going to be chloride. If this was HBr, then this would be dimethylammonium bromide. Only difference. Quaternary ammonium salts, this is what we call it when the nitrogen has now four groups on it. Um, and this is a quaternary amine, or we'll see with amides, we can have something similar. Um, no hydrogens, positive charge. Now choline, this is an example of a molecule that we saw in our lipids, right? Cholines being attached to uh, the phosphodiester bond in our um, glycerol, making those phospholipids. Um, uh, choline is a, is a molecule we saw. Properties of ammonia salts. These things tend to be very soluble or more soluble in water. In body fluids, so this is the, the, the medical relevance when we talk about our drugs and our medicines that have ammonium salts. This is why they are good in our bodies or why they work. They tend to be solid at room temp. They tend to be odorless. Um, and this all has to do with them now being ions as opposed to being um, you know, non-ionic. Um, as an example of some of the ammonium salts that we'll use in medications, uh, Benadryl, uh, diphenylhydramine. So you can see that here um, and here. Two different, uh, Sudafed and Benadryl, active forms are the ammonium salts. Uh, illicit street drugs as well, cocaine. For example, um, show you the structures here. Uh, cocaine can exist as the amine salt, hydrochloride, but it could also exist as a more potent form or a form that actually gets into your body a little easier um, as the, the crack cocaine. Um, this one in the free amine form um, actually produces a, a stronger high, which ultimately leads to um, increased addiction. Uh, let's see, draw the condensed structural form of ammonium salt formed by the reaction of trimethylamine 
and HCL. You should give this a shot. Go ahead and pause the video, give it a shot. Um, as far as the reaction would look, uh, how that would go, you would show your triethylamine reacting with HCl. Again, the transfer of the hydrogen, charges, show them both. Heterocyclic amines. Um, these are the ones that have special names, and since we're going to be doing probably at-home tests, um, I'm going to go ahead and assign these. So let's take a look at them. So there are two classes of heterocyclic amines. There's the five atom rings and then the six atom rings. Of the five atom rings, we've got pyrrolidine with one nitrogen. We've got pyrrol with one nitrogen and uh, two double bonds. And then we've got imidazole. And this one has two nitrogens, two double bonds. Um, we won't be finding these necessarily in this exact form, but we might see derivatives of them. So we might see a pyrrole with a CH3 on it. Um, that's going to be a pyrrole derivative. We might see um, an imidazole um, with, you know, variations to this structure, but it's still going to be a five-membered ring. It's still going to have two nitrogens. So that's the point. We've got six um, atom rings. We've got piperidine, we've got pyridine, we've got pyrimidine, and we've got purine. You may notice these two are actually the ones that we find in our DNA and in our RNA, purines and pyrimidines. Alkaloids are what we call compounds from plants that contain amines. Nicotine is an alkaloid, and I believe uh, caffeine is also an alkaloid. Um, they tend to be uh, biologically active compounds. In fact, we're going to see that our, um, is it not, not our steroid hormone, uh, but some of the, uh, I forgot what they are, some of the compounds later on in this chapter, we're going to see um, neurotransmitters um, are going to be nitrogen containing compounds because they are biologically active. Um, yep, caffeine. Here we go. Caffeine. It's interesting about caffeine. It's actually made by plants not so that we can take it and get a little buzz from it, but it's actually a, a um, like a, uh, I don't want to say it's a paralytic. It causes seizures in bugs. So bugs get on the plant, they get the caffeine in their nervous system, and then it causes their muscles to contract uncontrollably. Um, that's the point of caffeine. It's just interesting how it works in our bodies a little different. Uh, morphine and codeine, also alkaloids. Just see here nitrogen containing um, a lot of these are painkillers of course heroin too derivative uh, of the same compound it comes from the same plant um, we've actually modified the structure of, of heroin to obtain slightly less um, less uh, addictive um, pain medicines like oxycon all right so for this learning check what you want to do is decide which were th which of these are heterocyclic amines. And all that means is, does the nitrogen, is it part of the ring? So here, 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 heterocyclic. Here, not heterocyclic. Um, it would be a good idea, too, to go in here and try to name these. Which heterocyclic amines are these? All right, amides. Now, amides have a different functional group, carbonyl carbon attached to a nitrogen. That nitrogen can have two hydrogens, or they can be other um, alkyl groups. Amides are made from carboxylic acids and from primary or secondary amines. We're going to see that in order for an amine to react with this um, carboxylic acid, it has to have hydrogens on it. Uh, that's the only way that we're going to lose a water. So if there's no hydrogens, this won't happen. Um, here are two examples. So the reaction is called an amidation uh, or condensation reaction. It's an older name. Amidation, formation of amide. You see your water, see your ammonia, or your methylamine, and then we see our, our amide. Another characteristic of this reaction is of course that there is water produced 
And again, you're losing the OH from the acid, uh, H from the amine, and that's where your water comes from. Whatever is attached to the nitrogen stays attached to the nitrogen. So here we have a methyl group attached. There's still a methyl group. Um, go ahead and pause the video and give this one a shot. So you see the methyl group that was attached is still attached. I would go ahead and try to name this one as well. Remember, this is a benzamine, um, benzo, uh, benzoic acid reacting with, um, sorry, not a benzamine. This is a benzoic acid reacting with an amine to form a benzamide, benzamide. Uh, this would be N-methylbenzamide, if you were naming it. All right, let's see. So naming amides, we, uh, I think we, we did a few of these in class. Again, we're going to change the oic ending to have the word amide in it. Um, so here we have um, methanamide because there's a methyl attached to the amine. Um, this one is ethanamide. This is benzamide. Um, let's see. If there are any substituents on the nitrogens, you give those the N designation. If they're the same, you say NN. If they're different, you say N methyl, N isopropyl, you know, whatever they are. Uh, and then name it as the longest carbon chain. In this case, it's a butane, so it's butanamide. So you can look through the naming of that for yourself. Give these a shot. Um, ethanamide, or in the common terms, we would call this acete. You don't have to worry about those. Um, and then again, this one is propane, so propanamide. Uh, don't worry about the propionamide. Propanamide with an N-ethyl. N-ethyl. As far as amides go, we don't see the, the basic property as amines. Um, that double bond um, to the O and the N, this is actually what we call a conjugated double bond. So this alternates back and forth between being a single bond to the O and a double bond to the N. Uh, there's resonance here, and so that's why we don't see the lone pair acting like a base and doing, you know, running out there and grabbing H's. Uh, we're not going to see that because the double bond is busy doing this stuff. Um, only methanamide is liquid. Everything, all other amides are solids. Primary amides have the highest melting point because of the number of hydrogen bonds. So because the nitrogen uh, attached to two H's means that other amides can hydrogen bond with those H's. And so since they can connect, essentially, to each other, hold hands more often with each other, uh, primary amides have the highest boiling points. One less hydrogen, so these are lower. And then tertiary amides don't form hydrogen bonds at all with each other, for the same reason tertiary amines don't. Here, comparing a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary amine, you see the lowest melting point for the tertiaries. Um, as far as showing those go, you could see it actually much better in these, uh, in these slides. So um, here we're seeing the hydrogen bonding with water. Um, a primary amide can form two hydrogen bonds with the H's that it has, and then the nitrogen is free to do an additional hydrogen bond. So these guys tend to be the most soluble. Secondary amides only have one hydrogen to do a bond with, additional water molecules, and then the nitrogen can bond to one mo water molecule itself. Tertiaries only have the lone pair, so they can only form one hydrogen bond with water. These guys are the least soluble of the amides. And again, this follows the normal five carbons or less rule. Five carbons or more, these things tend to be insoluble anyways. Here is an example of an amide that is in our bodies. So this is urea, the simplest natural amide. This is what we break down, essentially, um, uh, nitrogen-containing compounds into, when we're not using them anyways. Urea. 
um, aspirin substitutes. So these are just examples showing again how amides this time and instead of amines, how amides are prevalent in some of the uh, biologically active compounds. Um, so this one, uh, acetaminophen, has an amide and phenacetin, an amide. Barbiturates, these things typically uh, are addictive, they typically are sedatives. Um, you can see many cyclic amides in these structures. All right, time for hydrolysis of amides. So where amidation gave us uh, the reaction between a carboxylic acid and an amine, the hydrolysis of an amide is going to give us back a carboxylic acid and an amine, or at least some form of those two. So let's take a look at what happens. This can happen, um, hydrolysis in any ways, in both acid and in base. I think what's shown here is an example of the base hydrolysis, but let's go ahead and take a look at the acid. So similar to what esters did in acid, we know that our carboxylic acid is going to come back just like that. So um, in acid conditions, uh, we're going to find the interface between our carboxylic acid and the amide. We're going to split that bond, and we're going to add the OH from the water to one side and the H from the water to the other side. So uh, in this example, nitrogen is going to gain an H. Here it is. And the carboxylic acid will gain an OH. Now, in acid conditions, we know what happens to amines. Amines get neutralized by acid to form their salts. So the additional thing that you need to take care of here is add the additional H and realize that it's going to have a plus charge. So this is what we get for acid hydrolysis. We get a acid back, carboxylic acid, and we get the ammonium salt. Now in base, something different is going to happen. So in base, we're still going to come in here and add an OH to the water side. I'm sorry, of the water to the carboxylic acid side. And we're still going to add an H to the amine side. And so you'll see that the amine here has a gained an H and the carboxylic acid will have gained an OH, except acids react with bases. So in this case, the base that's present is gonna react with our acid to pull off the hydrogen. And so as soon as that hydrogen forms, it gets pulled off, neutralized, and forms a water. Um, that's why we have the negative charge here. So we get the carboxylate ion, or the carboxylate salt. So and you're always having to worry about which which salt you have. In the acid hydrolysis, you're going to have the ammonium salt. In the base hydrolysis, you're going to have the carboxylate salt. Um, make sure to get these two reactions straight um, because you know they do produce different products and make sure that you're showing those charges. Um, so go ahead and give this one a shot. This is the hydrolysis of N-methyl pentanamide. So you obviously want to start off with two, three, four, five, your pentane, your pentanamide, and then this is N-methyl. So we've got uh, a CH3 group on there. Identify where your interface is, split it, add the OH, add the H. So give that a shot. I'll just skip through the solution here. Okay, here's another practice. Draw what happened, the hydrolysis of this in acid. So again, you're going to end up with the carboxylic acid. And you're going to end up with the amine. Right? Now this is going to gain a couple of H's here. It's also not shown, uh, an H is explicitly not being shown here. This is, also has another H on it already. Uh, that should have been shown. And so then this will gain so this was already here. It adds this one when you added this one. And then we're going to add another acid condition one from the lone pair. So the ammonium salt. All right, neurotransmitters. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about the neurotransmitters. These are the chemicals. We're also going to talk about the, the way that the nerve cell transmits this signal. And so this is a nerve cell, and this is a nerve cell. And this one's going to talk to this one. And the nerve cells have axons and dendrites. And the axons are the big, long limbs that it 
<coughs> excuse me, uses to uh, send the signal to the next cell, and then the next cell receives the signal through its dendrites. And so multiple cells can all be connected to the same uh, dendrite, or to multiple dendrites of the same nerve cell. So signals can come in from anywhere. This is how the, the brain's interconnected. When we talk about things like reuptake, when we talk about things like um, release of the neurotransmitter, this is what we're picturing. So here in the synapse, like the gap between the two nerve cells, um, there are receptors in the receiving nerve cell, and the little grooves in the receptors are going to match the shape of the neurotransmitters that get released. The neurotransmitters are stored inside vesicles, um, which are membrane-enclosed uh, little sacs, and these things come and merge with the plasma membrane and then spill their contents into the synapse. Now, reuptake is when the original cell that spit out the neurotransmitter takes it back in and stores it for use again. Uh, there's a few other ways of clearing the synapse of neurotransmitters, and we'll talk about those shortly. So the neuron is the nerve cell, dendrites uh, on one end, and an axon on the other end. The junction is called the synapse. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the electrical signal that reaches the axon of one cell triggers the release of the neurotransmitters into the next cell, uh, which the dendrites of the next cell are going to pick up. Um, we're not talking about the electrical impulses, but we are talking about the chemical um, compounds that are released. These that released are can be excitatory or inhibitory. So they can stimulate the receptors to send more pulses to more cells, or they can stop the, the cell that receives that neurotransmitter from doing anything else. And this happens at, um, at the, um, the, the binding protein, that receptor. Um, so let's take a look. Neurotransmitters can be removed a few different ways. We talked about reuptake. That's when they get pulled into the same cell that released them for storage. They can also be broken down by enzymes. We're going to look at how acetylcholine esterase gets rid of acetylcholine in the synapse um, in a few minutes. And then uh, they can also diffuse away. That just means that they don't stay in the synapse. They just kind of soak around outside the synapse. They get absorbed into the body um, or absorbed into the tissues or they just flow away. Since it's a high concentration right there at the synapse, they just kind of spread out. Um, neurotransmitters are often amines and are often in their alkylammonium ion form. Um, and they usually form a salt with either their carboxylate or ammonium um, charged species. We're going to look at acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, uh, serotonin, histamine, glutamate, and GABA. Okay, acetylcholine. Mainly, this one is involved with muscle contractions. Um, it's involved in other things as well, like memory. We'll see two situations. One, where um, poisons can actually affect your ability to re un, you know, release or relax your muscles um, because of the muscle contraction aspect of acetylcholine. We'll also see that in Alzheimer's disease, people don't have um, very much acetylcholine, and that's why they um, are having a hard time storing memories. Uh, acetylcholine um, structure here, um, when it's released into the cell uh, or released into the synapse stimulates um, the cell to contract and so this would be a nerve cell sending a signal to a muscle cell and so the synapse is the, the, the gap between those two and so the nerve cell just told the muscle cell hey here's a bunch of acetylcholine now that causes the muscle cell to contract now to get rid of the acetylcholine in the synapse this enzyme goes and breaks it apart it's an esterase so it's going to hydrolyze this ester bond. Um, this isn't an alcohol here. Uh, actually, it is an alcohol. We do get back the alcohol. This is that one, uh, that choline molecule that we've seen before. This is a, um, uh, an amino alcohol. It's got both groups on it. Once the acetylcholine is gone, the muscles will relax. Um, acetylcholine, um, sorry, choline and acetate are converted back into acetylcholine stored in the vesicles. I mentioned in Alzheimer's disease, if you um, have a decrease in your acetylcholine by at least 90%, um, you lose a lot of your ability to make memories. Uh, well, just into function, your brain to function. 
Um, there are cholinesterase inhibitors. So these drugs specifically don't break down the acetylcholine that, that got you know, squeezed into the synapse, allowing it to, to, to do more of a job than it would have. Nerve poisons actually inhibit that enzyme that goes in and that breaks down acetylcholine. Um, so this is why if you are poisoned in some way with these types of um, nerve poisons, then you're, you're unable to relax your muscles. They stay contracted because the acetylcholine stays in the synapse. Catecholamines are a class of neurotransmitter. These include dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. They all are related in structure, and they all come from the amino acid tyrosine. We're going to take a look at that. So um, um, amphetamine and methamphetamine are actually synthetic drugs. These work on our central nervous system, and what they do is that they are excitatory catecholamine neurotransmitters. So when one axon um, squirts acid, um, methamphetamines, I'm sorry, if methamphetamines are present in your body um, and they're in those synapses, they actually trigger your brain cells and your, and your cells to start releasing more catecholamines, um, more of these uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. So amphetamine and methamphetamine trigger the release in your body of dopamine and norepinephrine. So we'll talk about what dopamine and norepinephrine are for in a second. Um, amphetamines, though, can also be used um, to, to help improve somewhat uh, of, a, of a lack of focus. Um, you'll see that um, epinephrine and norepinephrine have um, some fight or flight type responses. Usually they, they can increase alertness and, and focus. Dopamine um, rewards you. Um, and so if you're being alert and focused and you're being rewarded for that, um, sometimes your brain uh, will associate those things together and kind of maybe work better. Work better. So here are the catecholamines um, down here, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Tyrosine, the amino acid, gets converted into something called L-dopa. And then L-dopa becomes dopamine. Dopamine becomes um, uh, norepinephrine and then norepinephrine becomes um, adrenaline. And so these are all uh, either a methylation or uh, getting a, an alcohol group uh, or a decarboxylation. We'll use a CO2 here. Anyways, um, they all come from L-DOPA. So we'll talk about how that can actually use, be used to treat um, deficiencies in dopamine here in a second. So dopamine is the reward chemical in your brain. Every time you do something good, your brain rewards you with some dopamine. Um, uh, it's normally um, uh, pulled back into the cell and stored. Uh, but if you take amphetamines and cocaine uh, or cocaine and types of amphetamines, sometimes these can block the reuptake of the dopamine, leaving it in the synapse longer. Um, doing that, of course, anything that makes dopamine come out more or stay more um, can be addictive. If you have a deficiency of dopamine, like if you have Parkinson's disease, um, you can take L-DOPA. L-DOPA will actually convert to dopamine in the brain. Um, and so if you don't make enough dopamine, you can at least take some L-DOPA, which will convert into dopamine. Um, yeah. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, these guys are the fight or flight um, chemicals. Um, these are hormonal neurotransmitters. They do have a role in sleep and um, alertness, as well as attention and focus. Um, epinephrine is turned into, um, sorry, um, turned, uh, norepinephrine is turned into epinephrine uh, by the addition of a methyl group. Um, let's see. Serotonin. This one is involved with sleep. Usually, um, um, uh, you've probably heard if you eat a lot of turkey on Thanksgiving um, that you're going to be extra sleepy. Turkey um, has tryptophan in it. Tryptophan is an amino acid. Um, you find tryptophan in a lot of proteins, so it's not just turkey. What actually um, is, is sort of the, the misconception is that tur turkey itself makes you sleepy. It's just that if you eat a lot of meat, so anytime that you binge on a lot of food, um, you're going to get a lot of tryptophan. Tryptophan can be turned into serotonin, and an increased serotonin level um, might, you know, make you feel extra peaceful, extra sleepy. Um, but it isn't just turkey itself that has tryptophan in it. Um, serotonin is also linked to depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders. And so um, in order to leave serotonin in the synapse longer, 
There are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which can be used to um, keep serotonin in the synapse longer and counteract uh, low serotonin effects. Um, these are those um, SSRIs. You can see that they're the uh, ammonium uh, forms of the amine. Histamines involved in allergic reactions. Um, usually histamine, uh, when, when an allergen is present, triggers the release of histamine, which then uh, usually leads to itchiness and um, uh, sneezing, various other symptoms. Um, it comes from um, histidine, an amino acid. Um, inflammation, watery eyes, itchy skin. Um, it can also be stored in the cells of the stomach where it stimulates acid production. So it's involved with um, your stomach's ability to digest food. Antihistamines go and they block the histamine receptor um, so that it doesn't sense that histamine has been released. Glutamate, the most abundant neurotransmitter, this one is what your brain actually uses to talk to itself. All the nerve cells communicate with, them, with each other through the release of glutamate. Um, Glutamate also is involved with a memory um, in that it stimulates synthesis of nitrogen monoxide, and these two together um, are involved in, in building memory and forming connections. Um, glutamate can be low levels of glutamate. Um, people with Lou Gehrig's disease don't have enough glutamate. Um, the reuptake is too rapid, and so you can also have, um, with low levels, um, schizophrenia or other mental illnesses, you know, brain issues. Uh, GABA stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. So we would probably figure that out. Butyric acid is just four carbons, right? That's the old name, butyric. We would say um, butanic acid. And then gamma is just telling us where the amino group is. This would be the alpha, beta, gamma. And we're going to see a structure here in a second. Uh, yeah, I was close. I didn't remember this guy. Anyways, uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, produced from glutamate. Oh. Yeah, I got it. But I didn't have the uh, amino salt version of that. Um, and I also didn't have enough carb. Yeah, I had enough carb. Um, this glutamate, sorry, amino acid glutamate, turns into GABA. GABA reduces anxiety by inhibiting the ability of nerve cells to send electrical signals. So it's an inhibitor, where all those others that we talked about were excitatory. This is inhibitory, and so it helps calm everybody down, stops the cells from talking to each other. In, involved in regulation of muscle tone, sleep, and anxiety. Um, you can get GABA through nutritional supplements. You can, um, you can inhibit uh, or um, increase GABA levels by taking medications such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates. Um, and it increases the GABA levels at the GABA receptors. Alcohol, sedatives, and tranquilizers increase the inhibitory effects of GABA, so using it at the same time. These guys, alcohol, sedatives, um, works together with GABA to give an increased effect. Caffeine decreases GABA's ability to um, inhibit the cells. And here's a summary of those neurotransmitters. So you don't need to know anything about their structures. You should know what amino acids they're derived from. You should know roughly what they're involved in, what, what part of what function they, they have. And so I, like GABA is inhibitory, um, glutamate's excitatory, that kind of stuff. Um, and then um, examples of, of something that they're used for or related to, like sleeper focus or uh, muscle contractions or, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that, this last one was wrong. Muscle contraction is up here. All right. So uh, that's Chapter 18, or at least the rest of Chapter 18. I'll be working on a Chapter 19 video for you guys. Um, all right. See you next time.